So this, um, all right. So this panel is a sort of CIPCHO IAC collaboration, which will be explained to you in greater depth by somebody who has more grasp of the details than do I, even though I dearly committed to it. Um, the subject is um, intellectual property, but you could call it also protecting creativity. And the members of the panel, uh, besides uh, me, um, as Gadfly, I guess, are Steve Benson, who is the Director of Communications for Sibjo, Bliss Lau, who is a designer, Daryl Motley, who is a patent attorney. C Jess, can you please correctly pronounce your name for us all? <laughs> yes, it's kind of difficult and long, Buziashvili. <laughs> and uh, who is a designer, and Sarah Yud from JVC. And to introduce the panel is Gaetano Cavaliere. So he will introduce and then yeah. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen. It's been a long day up to now. <laughs> and uh, <laughs> Tiffany, where are you going? Here. <laughs> this is this is the place. <laughs> it's working. <laughs> I was just uh, checking for Tiffany that is here. Oh, my mistake. Yes. My mistake. Tiffany is on this panel. Sorry, I, I thought redundancy. Me oh my God. Me again. No, we love you. Sorry, We're so I'm glad you're with us. Having a wonderful discussion outside. Very. That means that we move outside now. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So thank you very much again. Um, protecting intellectual property is uh, something that um, is essential in uh, every uh, sector, but specifically in our sector, uh, because we have so many designers, so many uh, jewelers, producer, wonderful pieces we have seen even today about uh, uh, what we have to do. Sibjo, the World Jewelry Confederation is um, an organization that uh, was born 1926 in Paris and um, has set standard since then. And all the standards are published in the blue books which are downloadable free of charge from the CIPJO website. We have uh, many other tools that helps the industry and those part of the industry, including designer, uh, manufacturer, uh, retailers, uh, to uh, better express their profession or our profession. Uh, one of the elements is intellectual property that, as we have said in many uh, areas, uh, of our industry, sometimes we can see from one side copy, from another side uh, responsibility mark, uh, and many other stuff. But uh, we have uh, today, and again, this is uh, the first of the many that will come in the future between Sibjo and um, uh, uh, Lisa and her organization with this wonderful panelists, and thank you very much for being with us. So I would like to express my satisfaction from one side, and I would like to express all of you the fact that um, maybe you can make some research because Sibjo is very well known all around the world, but not in America. <laughs> even, though, even though in America we have so many members, uh, including JVC, of course, and Tiffany is uh, president of one of our commission. Uh, but we would love to express uh, what we have been capable up to now, uh, what we are in America, but on the other side, we would like to have input from the American industry. Uh, this is the reason why 
we start this uh, partnership with Lisa, and I'm very happy. We will continue in September in Vicenza, then we will continue in October in Jaipur during the Sibjo Congress, then we will continue again in January and so on. Um, but we are there to uh, give this industry uh, how many tools we are capable to bring. Because our members and our people are people uh, highly professionals, such as Tiffany, such as John Mulligan, such as this uh, incredible panelist. Uh, and obviously, uh, to receive input, uh, we are pushed to do more and better. I rely on you, and thank you very much, Lisa. Okay, um, thank you so much, Gaetano. So um, I introduced the panelists briefly. As I mentioned earlier this morning, um, just so you know, there is in your packets a bio document, the addendum sheet. So there are bios on every single person sitting here. Um, and we encourage you to delve more deeply I'm doing this for the sake of precious time because there's a lot to cover in this discussion. And as you know, I am tasked with time. So I'm going to turn it to Steve. Um, Hi. Um, I'm Stephen Benson. I'm the Director of Communications of, uh, of, of SIBJA. Um, just before we start on the, we'll delve into the subject itself, I just wanted to speak a little bit about what we're doing together with, um, with the initiatives in arts and, uh, and culture. Um, it, it, it got, at the end of a long conversation, which actually took place for probably over a two year period, and uh, uh, we decided to set up some type of formal cooperation where we would, uh, Subjo does a lot of what has been taking place today, Subjo does on a regular basis. In different, in different parts of the world at different events. And we decided why, that um, it would be a good idea that if we, we could take a subject, and the assumption we're talking about an international industry, and then do a series and go in depth in, on, 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 on a number of different subjects, um, and look at it from different aspects in different parts of the world. And we decided to begin with the issue of intellectual, uh, of intellectual property. The idea is that we, we will start here. We will largely introduce the subject here in, uh, in New York. We will take a European perspective and maybe also look at it from the perspective of the watch industry um, in, um, in Italy in September at the Vicenza Aura Show. And, um, and then again in, um, in Jaipur, maybe broaden it again to include, uh, to include Asia and, some, um, and, and some, some other aspects, particularly where it comes to copying and counterfeiting and the like, um, at the Subject Congress and as part of the, the Ethics Commission, which is, at, which is headed by, by Tiffany, who is the president of the Subject Ethics Commission. And in, during that period of time, uh, sub, uh, et, uh, Tiffany's uh, commission will also produce what we call as a special report, and the special report will be specifically about the subject of intellectual property in the jewelry industry. Everything, including this event over here, is being, um, well, it's being broadcast at the moment, but it will also be recorded. We'll put all of the material up onto the, uh, onto the web uh, that so that people can view all three sections. We would be delighted to have you in Italy and also specifically in in India, if you want to make the trip. Um, but um, by the end of that period over here, I think that we would have most probably done and spoken and, and, and educated more about the subject of intellectual property more, most probably more than at others, any other stage that has been done up until now. Why intellectual property? I mean, how did we, how did we get to it? When, when Lisa and I first spoke about where you know, how we could go into, into the various sec um, sections. Lisa spoke about um, how interested she was in the subject of uh, premiums in the jewelry industry. How do, you know, how do we evaluate a premium on an item of jewelry? And um, I, sort, I 
sort of like delved off from there, and I actually went and I looked up uh, from an economic perspective what the what the definition um, of a of a premium is in any in any particular subject. And the premium, I'll find the actual definition of it. I'll read it to you. This is from Investopedia. It's the price paid for above and beyond some basic or intrinsic value. That's an essential um, standard over here. And in jewelry, essentially, the intrinsic value of the piece of jewelry is the cost of the materials of which the piece of jewelry is, um, is composed. The, the gold, the, the diamonds, gemstones, pearls, etc. The, the premium is anything that comes over and above that. And most probably the most important aspect of that premium is the creativity of the person who designs the piece of jewelry and the craftsmanship of whoever produces the piece of jewelry. And for an industry that is incredibly concerned with security, over here over there where you where you go to untold lengths in order to protect what you have in your stores or in your offices. Um, and, and, and I realize it's the insurance companies that, that, that dictate, dictate some of that over there. But you spend an inordinate investment in securing what uh, the, the materials that you work with. Um, very few people think about um, uh, protecting that premium that essentially most of your profit comes out of, which is your, the, your ability to take these precious items and turn them into a piece of, into a piece of art. And I think that that is where we come from. It's a subject that is most probably more relevant today than it, than, than it has ever been in the past. And it dovetails with a lot of the various things that were spoken about during the event today, particularly the way in which people spoke of the opportunity that, that, uh, that they've suddenly had by being able to display their work on, on Instagram or maybe on Pinterest. And people are selling their goods on Etsy. And th these are the me what, what you're essentially doing is that you're taking the material that you've got and you're placing it out there in the public domain. So the opportunity for people to come in and copy what you have done is considerably greater than it ever was before. And people do not protect that, uh, um, that, uh, th that material. You, you, the, the source, essentially the source of your income is, is open for the world to take. Those same programs over there also, on the one hand, it's raised the level of risk, but your ability today also to investigate whether your designs are being used by other people has also, it has also increased tremendously because you have the access to the same technology. So I think that, that is where we, that, that essentially is where we started the discussion and then bang, began the discussion together with, 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 with Tiff and with, um, with Sarah from JVC. Who, um, who were happy to come on board and said, Let, let's, let's do something like, uh, with that over here. So what we, what we thought we would do, and we're working on the assumption over here that it's a subject that everybody maybe have thought about, but people have limited knowledge about, that we would start out with a, a primer on intellectual property within the jewelry industry, <coughs> using the, the knowledge of, we've actually got three <coughs> lawyers at the, on, on the total panel over here. Daryl is a lawyer as well, but we'll leave him for the later part of the discussion, um, and talk, essentially lay out what is an intellectual property, and then we will look at some real life examples of people who've dealt with it. Um, uh, and for that, we'll use our other, uh, we'll use our other panelists. Um, so maybe we'll start out, so maybe start, how, what, how do you define intellectual property in the jewelry industry? from a legal perspective, and, and, and I think we should look at it in the broader sense, not only in terms of the design, but also the intellectual property that is contained within a, within a marketing program. Yeah, I'm actually gonna let Sarah speak to this, but I will just as a, as a asterisk point out what the JVC does on this, because this is a big part of what we do. And JVC, we have this sort of like very broad view, where just, scanning the horizon for danger all the time, sort of on everyone's behalf. So the way that works in IP, and because we're lawyers, a lot of times people come to us and say, oh my gosh, someone's copying me, which is like always the worst thing, and we wanna 
hug them and help them and we want to find a lawyer that can help them directly. But what we're doing is um, things that are a little bit broader. So we have a mediation program and in that program, it's low cost. People can come not really for that one-to-one -one copying, but maybe things that are a little bit more unusual. So an example would be if you're a designer and you went to a manufacturer to have your goods manufactured and then that manufacturer decided that the, your design was so great they wanted to keep they wanted to manufacture it under their own name and steal it and maybe even keep your molds too um, we've settled one of those we get money back for people we get people to stop doing things like that so that's a sort of a sort of in between the small and the big um, another thing that's really special about the JVC and anybody who went to law school knows about us because we have standing. So that's like the right to sue, right? The basic right to sue as a trade organization um, for trademarks. So once a week, Sarah or someone on our team looks at the trademark register to see who is, what trademarks are being registered in our category of jewelry. And if there's anything that we feel would be too much of a gain for any one company, like someone tries to trademark the word gold or something, too generic, um, we, litigate that we file that we fight that sort of on your behalf um, and we have i think like a 100 percent success rate so we do several of those a year um, so those are some of the ways that we're sort of always looking out for everybody and then we're also out there at places like couture working with emerging designers or doing other education like this helping people understand the broader strokes of ip but if you need like one-to-one -one help um, you need to go to a private attorney, which someone in private practice who does patent, like my uh, fellow co-panelist or someone else that we can recommend to you. So with that, I'll, I'll leave it to Sarah to give us the bigger picture. Sure. Um, so the way I like to think about what intellectual property is, is that it protects the products of the human intellect. So that is inventions, but also art, and also branding. Um, those are sort of three different areas that are protected by intellectual property law. And the concept of intellectual property law actually comes from the Statute of Anne from 1710, where in, in the UK they started allowing authors and creators to control their work as opposed to publishers um, who used to control work. And so that was sort of the, the, the origination of sort of like the modern concept of copyright law. Um, the, the US Constitution actually talks about intellectual property law as a concept in Article One, Section 8. Uh, I did look this up because I used to know this off the top of my head, but I've been out of law school for a really long time now. Um, but Congress shall have the power to promote the progress of science and useful arts by securing for limited times to authors and inventors the exclusive right to their respective writings and discoveries. So that's from 1787. Uh, in the U.S. Constitution. And since then, the U.S. has developed this very, very full way of protecting intellectual property. And it really boils down, I think, for the purposes of this jewelry conversation to three major areas. So that's copyright, trademark, and patent. So copyright protects artistic expression. So that would be your jewelry designs, your drawings, your paintings, your musical compositions, books, things like that. Trademark pr protects your brand your brand name, your logo, slogans, uh, the NBC chime, protected by trademark. NBC, that's protected by trademark. Um, and then uh, smells and colors can also function as trademarks in some respects. Um, and then you have patent protection, which prevent, uh, protects inventions and, and new and novel design elements and things like that. So that's sort of where, where we fall into three buckets when we're talking about this from a jewelry perspective. Right. The, now the three, I mean, you define the three and um, the, the, the protection that you get, you get from each, each one is different and the length of protection of each one is different as well and the ability to obtain each one is, is, is different also. Can you... Yes, and I'm going to ask Daryl to help me because patent is uh, very cool and not my subject because I didn't, I don't have an undergraduate science degree, so I was never eligible to sit for the patent bar. Um, but so for copyright protection, you you pay a, a low fee to the U.S. Copyright Office to submit your design, and it's you know six months to two years later, you'll get a response from them. Uh, and they will tell you, great, you now have a copyright. Your protection is 
lasts for the life of the last living author plus 70 years. Um, so if you co-authored a piece with somebody, they will wait until the last one of you passes away and then they will count 70 years after that. And then after that, anything that you have designed enters the public domain. Um, you can also tag this to the year. So I think it's now, it's either 1924 or 1925. Anything that was published before 1925 is in the public domain automatically. Um, so if you're looking for inspiration, I do suggest you go to like back catalogs of jewelry from before 1925. Uh, that is all available for you to take and modify and use for yourself. Uh, trademark protection can last indefinitely. The cost to get a trademark ranges, it depends on how many different categories, but it's you know, approximately $400 plus whatever fees you're going to pay to your lawyer to do that, usually a flat fee. Uh, your protection lasts indefinitely. So if Coca-Cola continue using use continues to use the mark Coca-Cola in commerce forever, they will be able to keep their trademark forever. Um, patent protection is 16, 19. I don't remember. Daryl, help. Sure, sure. <laughs> so there's actually there's two types of patents. Yeah. Uh, there's the utility patent that's the 20 years from initial filing. We have the utility type. There's also a design patent, and that's 15 years from grant no time based on what it's filing. And so the, so in the jewelry industry, probably the most you would use design patents could be used, ornamental, line, ornamental looking, how it looks as well. There's some issues about how to get that. And the utility side as well, you can use that as well, but it's not as common, um, uh, but it, it's, it's available as well. Thank you. Hmm? And the... Um, just said, just, just, just to say that I'm, I'm clear. So, Tiffany, the name Tiffany is, is trademarked, and, they, and they, they would hold it. The blue box, trademarked or copyrighted? Trademark. So nobody could use a blue box? Nobody can use as, that as exact shade of blue to make a box for jewelry. It's eight, shade 1837. <laughs> Great. <laughs> <laughs> Um, but then also, they probably have some smaller logo that they stamp on the inside of their jewelry with their fineness marks that will also be trademarked. They probably have 12,000 different names of different lines of jewelry that have also been registered as a trademark. Um, they might have some pieces in their collection may have gained so much notoriety that the design of the piece itself can function as an identifier of their brand, in which case that is a roundabout way of getting trademark protection. That's um, the, the current thought for like Disney basically took the Mickey Mouse shadow and turned that into a trademark and that's gonna protect Mickey Mouse when the copyright expires. Right, but, but there was a case, there was a case with <laughs> Tiffany and Costco, right? Yes, that was about a, a, a ring design. And and Tiffany, Tiffany lost the case. Sort of. Can you? <laughs> right. why, okay. Why? So the Tiffany and Costco case um, was about uh, the design of a solitaire ring. It was a six prong setting, and the issue at, in that case was that Costco was selling a ring that was in a six prong setting and calling it a Tiffany setting, and Tiffany objected to them using their name to describe the setting, and they, they essentially were arguing that, well, this is a generic way to describe the setting itself. We are getting into the weeds uh, a bit, so they did, uh, they, they won, and then they lost, and then they settled. So, 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 we, so we essentially don't know what happened. Correct. Yet. Okay, which, which, uh, which is part of the problem, I think, in, in, in the subject. Uh, the, when, when, we, when we sort of investigated it over here, the, it, it seemed, um, that, almost, that, that, that when the cases are litigated and they, they ultimately are settled out of court so that you never really know what the result is. Um, so it, so it, takes, it takes a subject that I think is often difficult to get your head around and actually makes it even more difficult because, we, because although the law seems clear over here, the, the way in which the law is interpreted in the end, uh, it's, not, it's, it's, it's not published. So are there things you can do other than sue to protect yourself? Of course, always. Such um, as? <laughs> so there are, uh, I, th I like to think of get obtaining 
protection itself as a defense mechanism. So if you register your, you know, your copyright, if you, you know, register your trademark, if you apply for a patent, you then get to tell people that you've done that. And that in and of itself is part of a defensive strategy against copying. Um, there are lots of other ways that you can protect your designs. You can decide, okay, I'm only going to put X number of items on Instagram because I think my most pop, you know, the item that I'm most proud of or I'm most is, is selling well. Like I actually don't want everybody to be able to figure out how I'm doing this. So I'm going to hold back information. Um, so that's a thing you can do. A, I think for a while there, we've talked a lot in the industry about Diet Prada, the Instagram account as a potential um, avenue for sort of like publicly naming and shaming copiers. And, the, and it worked for a while. They've sort of moved away from that themselves. Um, but I don't necessarily think that that's, that in and of itself is a great avenue because you can you know, you're, you're sort of opening yourself up to the court of public opinion as opposed to an actual court where there are qualified people who evaluate these things. Um, so I wouldn't recommend that as, a, as necessarily the best way to protect. So, okay. Go I'm ahead. sorry. No, no, please. No, I'd say, say the, way, the, way, the way that I see it, the, the way that I saw it, and that was sort of the way when we looked into the subject and, and, and thought of how we were going to discuss it, is that the use of, of, uh, of the protection of intellectual property over here would, would fall ex essentially into two, into two areas. Either you're simply trying to protect it over here and, and, and that you are ready to defend that, um, that copyright trade, trademark or patent in the event that, uh, that's, that somebody or you believe that somebody has, has stolen it. That's number one. And the second is that the, that the, the, the protection of intellectual property, be it through a trademark, be it through a copyright or even a patent, becomes part and parcel of a branding exercise. It's the way that, that, you, that you build your brand, you protect your brand, and you show other people that the brand, that the brand, belongs, that the brand belongs to you. Um, the, the, the difficulty, and maybe if you can, if you can um, um, explain that over there, is, is particularly in the, in, in the first case over here, is that if you do want to defend it, um, it's difficult for a small company to do. I mean, it's expensive. Uh, the, the, and, mm -hmm. um, and if you're going up against a big organization, it's, um, it's intimidating. It certainly is expensive. And I think, I, I think it's important to talk about registration itself as a barrier, right? So if you have to be able to show, in order right. to obtain copyright registration, right. for example, you have to be able to show some originality in the piece. In the jewelry industry, a lot of the designs that we use are designs that have been used over and over and over again. And you may be introducing a new or novel perspective on that design. Um, but the Copyright Office is made up of a bunch of lawyers in their, like in suburban Virginia, I believe, uh, uh, who maybe don't are, aren't so versed in the jewelry industry and don't necessarily know about the art of our industry. And so they're gonna look at a submission and maybe not necessarily grant it. So you first, the first barrier is getting that protection in the first place. And then of course it's enforcing it and the costs associated with it. So we always tell folks, you know, you gotta get registered first. So in, in copyright, for example, you have to have a registration in order to sue someone uh, for infringement. You must have registration first. Um, and so getting that is the first step. And then the next step is you send a cease and desist letter and you say, I am the owner of copyright registration number, blah, 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 and you are infringing my copyright and here's all the information and you need to account for your sales and you know send me remuneration or I'm going to sue you in court. Sometimes people send that letter and then they do not follow <coughs> through on the lawsuit because the lawsuit is too expensive. But sometimes just sending that letter is enough to scare somebody into stopping infringing the work. It's it's complicated, it's expensive, and it's hard. Jess, why, I mean, you, you went the, the, at least the patent route over here, that why, why didn't you explain who you are, why, you, why did you decide to, to, uh, to go to that expense? Okay, um, hi, my name is Jess. I'm the designer behind uh, luxury brand Ox, which I set out 
many years ago to design, but my previous background before that was in antique and periodic jewelry. So I had the luxury of really looking at pieces that were not only timeless, but stood the test of time. So in many ways, it was a very romantic way to get here because I wanted something with modernity, but also was classic enough to remain timeless and heirloom. And I set out actually to design something just for the fun of it. And my brother, who is now also my business partner and best friend sitting right there, was like, Jess, you, you need to go seek counsel. This is something that you should look into. He at the time was working for the Fashion Law Institute and they had a <coughs> symposium and I attended. And Daryl has been my hero in this and championed this for now seven years, was like, yeah, let's do this. And <coughs> since then we've been working together on this. And yeah, I do have patents officially as of January 2020. <coughs> Okay, I'm just gonna speak for Ox. You, if you're even in the first row, you can't tell. You have to go up to Jess and look at her jewelry. It is truly novel and very interesting and very fresh and like obviously an act of engineering. And it's no wonder that you were awarded multiple patents. But anyway, please make sure that you actually touch and look at this jewelry because it's very, very, very interesting. Thank you, Tiffany. <laughs> I would just say, like, as a, uh, um, my name is Bliss Lau. I'm an independent jeweler. I've been making fine jewelry since 2014. I've had several experiences that we just discussed. I have never received any of my copyrights that I've applied for, mm -hmm. ever. Yeah. May I? <laughs> May I? Yeah. So, uh, I, I, part of my background is I, I teach design law, which covers trademark, trade dress, <laughs> design patents, and utility patent law. And the, the copyright office is taking this view that nothing's original almost in jewelry. If you go, I looked at the co copyright review board, they're refusing everything. And so how do you, res how do you resolve that issue, right? Yeah. If, if you were, like Jess's case, just may I? May yes, I? please. In Jess's case, she was brand new in her designs, brand new. So in, in the US, you have a one year grace period to file a design patent or a utility patent, or you lose it forever. Because if you don't, if you, if you like publicly disclose it on your website, and then you have to go to the copyright context. And then, and, um, and Sarah's right, there's, it's, it's more in DC, but, <laughs> but, they, but these, 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 these uh, lawyers, they say, and I, and it's, and it's, and I think it's, uh, I, I take offense to it, because what, what they do is they say, the designer didn't design anything new. Everything's common elements. I, I could go through opinions now and say, everything's common shape. You look at it and go, that's a great design. But they're like, oh, that's just, anybody could have done that. Um, it's, it's really bad. But on the design patent context, if you can do it within, within the year you launch, hopefully before that, because we can get a national, <coughs> that's not, that standard doesn't apply. You have to have something that looks like it. You don't have somebody waving their hand and saying, oh, by the way, sorry, I take this pretty seriously because it's personally, because it's designers want to de that, oh, I, that looks familiar, right? Because that's what they see. You see the opinions, right? Yep. I, I seen this common shape, and I, so I, I could go through all the opinions. But anyway, um, I'm, I'm sorry about that. I don't, I don't know how we can fix that with the, with the, the corporate office until so maybe they change the law or, or change some um, cases to do that because that, that has been, that's happening recently, the last probably three to four years after Star Atletica. Anyway, I'm getting the weeds, but. Well, but, um, so I think yeah. one of the reasons why Lisa asked me on this panel is because I've had this crazy experience that kind of is, encompasses all the things we've just talked about. And when I first came out with jewelry, I launched as, with a body chain collection and it was very innovative in 2007. It was not anything anyone had seen. And there was a very famous supermodel who really liked my piece and she wore it and she purchased it and then she made a version of it. And I had been trying to sell my stuff for several years and I had a very hard time selling. They literally had buyers laugh at me and tell me no one was ever gonna buy that. No one would ever wear that. And eventually I got to a place where I had two stores that had placed orders and that supermodel came out with a collection of pieces and all of my stores called me and said someone simultaneously came up with the same idea and unfortunately we can't sell your stuff anymore. And then she came out in all these magazines wearing literally my piece. 
And I was this like anonymous, independent person working nights at a hotel doing co check. And I didn't know what to do. I went to Volunteer Lawyers for the Arts. And it's probably the only time I will ever be able to say White and Case was my lawyer. <laughs> um, and two woman lawyers from White and Case got it. And this is actually the only copyright I ever got was they rushed it and they were able to get me the copyright on that body chain. And Great. nothing ever really settled, but what did happen was the court of public opinion happened and people found out about it and people got really angry. Anyone mm -hmm. who's been in fashion a long time already knows this story and knows me from this story, but the court of public opinion was the only thing that really stood behind me in that scenario because I never made any money. I wasn't able to sue her for it because she never went to market with it and she never ended up selling those stores. And in fact, eventually I did, but like it was just, it was just this terrible experience that I had. And so then when I moved into fine jewelry in 2014, I invented this, which I can show you, this ring design and I have a utility patent on it. And the first thing I did was go and get it patented. Congratulations. Thank you. I got it the first in my first try, which was amazing. And I've since wanted to have design patents on my work, but if you're looking at one to two to three thousand dollars for every single design, it's prohibitive for me. So I, I've chosen not to move forward with a lot of my inventions because of that. It's been difficult, but when you ask yourself if I'm am I gonna pay for marketing, investing in my business, or am I going to have a design patent, and will I then be able to litigate if somebody s tries to appropriate my ideas? The answer is I'm not going to do it, and that's kind of the unfortunate thing. So I am now relying on the court of public opinion. So is there a solution? Can I make it worse? Yeah. Okay. <laughs> <laughs> Another thing we see is, so this is all if you're working with a legitimate actor in the United States, right? That's all yeah. we've really talked about so far. Another thing we see is um, folks who have their Instagram or website copied. No one's even copying their designs. They're just copying all, sometimes leaving the brand name on and creating a fake uh, Etsy, Amazon, what am I, eBay, whatever profile and with a lower price and then sending God knows what to these customers who are paying them. So they're using you as a front for fraud, uh, which goes even a step beyond just copying. And uh, unfortunately, you know, first of all, they're not US players, so it's more difficult to enforce these rules. And then also we're in this situation uh, with this thing called Section 230, which is um, how platforms like Facebook or Instagram or Etsy get to say like, hey, this isn't our problem. So we've tried many times to approach the lawyers at these platforms just to say, can, is there anything you can do? Do you have any internal standards? Do you care at all? And they don't have to care. They're allowed, they are not um, tasked with uh, really moderating the content and they're not held accountable if they're doing something wrong. And so um, we find that that's like another layer of challenge that we see. And oftentimes, ironically, it's a, it's a level of success. It's when you start to get some momentum and some success, the reason you know that you're actually reaching that point of success is you start being the victim of this kind of copying and even like sort of fraudulent behavior. Sorry. <laughs> uh, but the, and here I'm, I'm speaking completely as a layman. I mean, it, it sounds like a hopeless situation. Um, that, uh, uh, that, you know, I'll go back to my original comment, saying that, that you know, the, what, sets, what sets you as a jeweler apart from any other, any other jeweler is, is, you know, what, what you bring from within yourself or mm -hmm. with, from the group of people that you work with. And, um, and the only thing that you can really protect and you have to do it physically. Is the is is the jewelry itself? Um, is you know, the, is there any other avenue or any other any other um, legal uh, um, solution that that somehow could you know pr pr protect particularly smaller jewelers over here who who aren't you know who aren't going to go up against you know, who you know aren't going to sue one of the larger companies. Um, you know the the, the 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 image of the Disney characters over here. That's easy. I mean, the, you know, Disney's got a 
you know, it's got a, has, 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 has got a whole stable of lawyers that will, that will defend them. But what, you know, what about a, what about a company that is, that is really producing something unique that uh, is, you know, that sees it, sees it being used by other people? Is there no other solution than well, what Well, I have one solution here? and I'm currently wearing it. Uh, <laughs> So Marie Lichtenberg makes lockets. They were ripped off. They're, they're very beautiful and they're very expensive. And they were constantly getting ripped off. And she decided, I'm so mad about this, I'm just going to knock myself off. Um, so she made this, which is a representation of her locket, but it's in food grade resin <laughs> glitter. Uh, and instead of selling them for the you know 5,000 euros that she sells her regular lockets for, this was like $265. I paid retail for this because I loved the concept so much. Um, and you know, like I think there's a lot of ways that designers can become really clever about you know how they protect their work and what they choose to put out into the world. Is it hopeless? No. Is it hard? Yes, and this is like, part of that is because we are in, as we've talked about all day today, we are in a global information economy where everybody is consistently able to access everybody else's information. Right, it, 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 it is a, there, there is a, a moral tale over here. I mean, or this, or, or lesson that should be learned in, in terms of how you're marketing your product over here. The degree to which you're just piecemeal throwing out stuff out on Instagram um, or, uh, on Pinterest and you know putting it out there saying people will come to me they, you know they, there's there's real risk involved in how you do that um, and the, the you know the solutions that you have seem to be uh, seem to be limited limited particularly if you are a smaller company with uh, with limited resource Daryl I'm looking at you and yeah, thinking I, you might well, want was, to say something yeah I was just <laughs> gonna say no it's okay it's 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 a uh, you have to have, I guess, the Instagrams and the well, the Facebooks. They do have takedown procedures, mm -hmm. um, and and but like the, like copying the uh, the whole Instagram. That's an issue. That's real. But if you have some IP right, I'd say I'd say I'm going to use this word design patent because if they're potentially there, um, you could you could when they see a patent number, there is a they, it moves them. Um, Copyright sometimes doesn't move, <laughs> but patent it does. Trademarks it kind of does too if you have registration, but kind of sort of. But the design patent it, it moves because it's a, a patent and they and they, they have an issue with that. So they do they do take them down. Amazon will you probably have Amazon issues too probably. And if you don't, that's that's good. <laughs> but Amazon can take things down sometimes too. See, so there's there's you can't there's some things you can do. But that's an interesting idea, the knock off of yourself kind of thing uh, <laughs> as well. Um, but I, I think in, 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 even in the branding case, if you built the, like Tiffany, let's go Tiffany's, they, they built the, the box of the trade dress on their box. So we all know that blue, what's the color again? 1837, <laughs> it's the year of their founding. Okay. Oh. So, so that color blue, you know, but we have Blue Nile that also has a blue color, but not exactly. They're in jewelry, right? But they have a different blue color, um, but I, I, they hadn't been sued by Tiffany, I guess. So you can sort of see the big, the big companies out there and maybe do kind of pull different areas and scope your, scope your rights a little differently and still hopefully survive in the, in the market. I do know it's a difficult task, but I think you just have, we have to be creative, all this. Well, anyway, I'll be quiet. You uh, just need a Daryl. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, we're going to give you guys a chance to ask questions. Anybody? Questions? Rob? Yeah, um, I, I know a guy who's telling me he, uh, he gets designs by going, um, he goes to Pinterest and Instagram, then puts it through AI and gets kind of like a mixture. So uh, are we going to get AI, uh, copyright infringement, uh, design, patent uh, lawsuit soon? Uh, uh, I think there's already happening. Probably. Yeah, on copyright, there's already definitely. Yeah, copyright, but not design necessarily. Uh, well, designs, desi the AI can't be an inventor on designs. Yeah. Uh, that, we know that. That's patent office taking that well, approach. Well, change it a little bit, mix it up. Uh, or if the, if the AI, well, 
let's say if the AI copies a design, then whoever in, whoever is the person who's promoting the AI, I guess you will, probably be subject to, to lawsuit or some kind of cease and desist, I suppose. That may be part of the analysis you're looking at. I'm not sure. It's it's brand new issue. Um, uh, Chat GPT AI. We have some lawyers using it to file briefs and <laughs> no real cases. <laughs> Bad results. <laughs> so. And that's part of the the fight right now, right? That's just burgeoning is the source material for AI and and arguing that that is intellectual property and can't just be scraped wholesale and treated as if it came from the gods or whatever, came from the sea or whatever, sprung up out of nowhere. Um, so it feels, I don't know if you guys have more insight, but um, it seems like that's where the fight is right now. Well, I've got, I've got, I've got a bit of, I, I lost a client uh, a short while ago um, who I was writing a, a, a blog for on a sort of regular basis. And he came to me and said um, that he was he was ending the relationship uh, because um, he said not not because we have any problem with what you're writing. We're very happy with the work, but uh, we did you know we discovered over here that we could uh, we, we we could do it on uh, using uh, Chat uh, GPT um, and and um, so I said he said what we do is we we'll, we'll go to you know, copy a story by Rob Bates or from Rapport or something like that over here. We'll run it in the program, ask them to rewrite the story, and we post it. And it posts the story, it finds illustration, puts the stuff up on the, uh, on the, on, on the, on, on the internet. And it will actually post it on the, on, on the guy's website as well. For the, it comes as a package. Um, I presume exactly the same stuff can be done, as we said, of, you know, keep, you know copying from, uh, from, from, Instagram or Etsy that, and um, they mash up the design. I, did, I mean, does is is there is there a copyright is there a copyright protection? Because it it's death. I I know it's happening to people like ourselves. It's it's an open question, I think. And one thing to note with copyright. Um, th I think there's a there's this like long-standing myth that if you change X number of elements of someone's design that you're no longer infringing, that's not real. Um, that's just a myth. Um, if, if somebody can prove that you did actually copy their design, even if you did, did then change other elements of it, um, you can still sue someone for copyright infringement. Anybody else? Um, Dorothy? I just have a, a like a legal question actually. Uh, do you in the U.S. do you have to trademark your uh, maker's mark before you can use it to quality mark your uh, carrot gold? And I'm so and glad you asked that question. <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. In the United States, there is a law called the National Gold and Silver Stamping Act. It was passed in 1906, signed into law by President Teddy Roosevelt. And in that law, it says that if you are stamping your jewelry with a fineness mark, so 14K or 95 or anything like that, you must also include your federally registered trademark with that stamp. So you have to have a registered trademark in order to legally mark your jewelry with fineness. If you do not want to use register a trademark, just don't put fineness a fineness mark on the jewelry. It's not required in the U.S. that you have that. Thanks. I uh, Anna? That's important. Um, I just wanted to sort of pose a, a different scenario that I know is common for a lot of designers who get approached by, let's say, a clothing brand or, you know, let's do a diffusion line or let's do a collaboration but the price points don't work or, you know, et cetera, et cetera. I mean, I think this has happened for decades and decades, but um, for a smaller designer that doesn't have the resources to copyright their work, let's say they have a meeting with a larger brand and, you know, advance some discussions, but then decide not to move forward with the partnership. This is just a scenario I've seen play out a thousand times. Um, and then that larger sort of fast fashion design house goes ahead with production of very similar line of jewelry for 75 cents a piece. Um, is there a recourse um, short of litigation? 
short of that? Well, well, or, or is there a recourse that might be accessible to a really small scale designer? So two interesting things about both copyright and trademark are that you don't actually have to register either in order to have some rights. Um, so the way that you form, like you get a copyright is you, you write something down. You, you fix it in a tangible medium. That's the legalese. So basically you do a drawing of your jewelry or you make a recording of your song or something like that. So there are rights that attach to you once you do that, even before registration. Um, I don't know if anybody has been successful uh, you know, enforcing common law copyright rights in a very long time, but that is a concept that does exist. Um, the same thing happens with trademark protection is when you start using a mark in commerce, um, you get protection for that even before registration. So it's not like there's nothing happening before you get to that registration point. Um, short of litigation in that situation, I think you are forced to use the court of public opinion, which is the Diet Prada route, um, which may, which might be successful. It certainly was for, um, you know, someone like Marla Aaron when, you know, <coughs> I can't remember the name of the brand, but there was a brand that came out with a piece of jewelry that was very, very similar to some of the style that she made. And she said nothing about it, but lots of other people said a lot about it. And they ended up pulling that piece from the market because so many people were talking about how similar that design was. Um, so I think that's certainly an outlet and maybe Bliss, you have another a similar perspective or a different perspective no, on I that. No, I mean, I think that's really valuable because getting the visibility from something like that is really helpful. And But I think like there's the forgotten part that comes from the creative where what happens to your creativity when your ideas are stolen, you know? Like I can tell you that I stopped making body chains for 10 years, I'm gonna relaunch soon, but like, it broke me to have that experience. Mm -hmm. So what ha like it kills creativity to have your creativity stolen. But I have another question, like when it goes back to the thing that you were saying about Tiffany with the six prong, like, so there's the idea and then there's a level of success and then there's a level, level of it becoming ubiquitous in the, in the world and it becomes a trend. And so this is something we see all the time. I think Anna can speak towards it as well. This design, this swirl design, everyone just starts doing it. And you used to call it copying, but now they just call it reiteration. This is just something I see that's happening. I don't know if anyone else is noticing this. Sure. Uh, I don't know. I mean, I, I definitely agree with that bliss. I mean, um, for sure, I feel like there's many things that come out into the marketplace and you don't know who did it first. And there's that sneaking suspicion that you always have that it feels overly redundant and either you're seeing the same designer a hundred times or it's a hundred different designers. Um, but in, in a way, I try to look at that almost as a compliment, like you're doing a lot of work for me there, aren't you? Because <laughs> ultimately it's, um, there's something you just have to stay, I, at least I try to stay as focused as I can. I try not to really see too much outside of what I'm doing because it allows you to continue to channel and foster that creativity and your thought process. And it's so true that like even when you go into production, you kind of house any other ideas. You're just like, I can't go into my creative space. Being in a creative space is really sacred to designers and creatives alike because it allows you to kind of not kind of, it allows you to fully express what it is you want to materialize. And um, it takes a particular headspace to be in and to be able to sustain. So I, it's a good question, I don't know. Can I, can I just add to your question? Uh, I don't know if this is, this is a new, a new government setup actually. The Copyright Small Claims Court. Um, you don't need a copyright registration. It can go up to $30,000. Um, I'm a law school adjunct at Howard University Clinic and, and, the, and the copyright office is set up law schools to offer pro bono. It's brand new, like a year, maybe a year and a half. Yeah, like we don't know what's gonna happen, how it's gonna go because yeah. they haven't issued any decisions yeah. yet. Yeah, it's so new. <laughs> but it's, it's, a, it's a chance. I mean, it's, it's, it kind of is litigation in a sense, but you can do, uh, uh, I know it's, um, Pro se, but but 
but if the law schools get more involved in it, maybe you know, going there, it's th it's up to thirty thousand, um, and maybe the jewelry. I mean, like you said, it's so brand new. Maybe the jewelry. Um, if you have jewelry that they're they're not they're close, maybe they'll say, well, you know, copyright office is going to tell us, you know, thirty thousand, whatever it is. But it, it is a new, so new. They said, seriously, we don't even know anything yet, but that's one avenue. We're hopeful. Yeah, that's exciting to hear. I think it's just the general sense from the designers I know is just like absolute resignation. So mm -hmm. like, you know, I think that mm -hmm. it's exciting to hear that there are other avenues. Uh, okay, last question, Annie. Oh, thank you. Thank you very much. Um, I'm Ani Katchen. I'm the founder of Ani Fine Jewelry. Uh, Bliss, uh, I can relate to what you were saying, um, but I, I'd just like to have your ideas and opinions uh, based upon not just what you do, but how you do it and the techniques that you use. So if you're working with wax, as my father was a master jeweler and his work was all in wax, um, I work in computer-aided design. So when I create a design, I know how I create it. So when I see an emulation with a percentage that's slightly a variant of that, I know that that can only be made from computer-aided design. It can't be made by wax. So I just stay positive, but my question to you is, is how can you help a person um, who recognizes that level of detail and sophistication and help them protect their work? Is that, that's, that's it. <laughs> I mean, I think that's, We've been talking about <laughs> the whole time. <laughs> I, yeah, because I, that's actually yeah. one of the things. CAD was what facilitated this design inspiration. I took CAD for a long time, mostly because I wanted to understand the difference between a bench jeweler and uh, what we're creating today. And oftentimes, you come to a jeweler, they're like, yeah, we can't do this. This is impossible. Or they can do it, but it's too thick. So you kind of have to reverse engineer your understanding of how things can even be made, right? Um, so when I was doing a lot of different things, and I, I didn't just come to Daryl with one of my ideas. I came with several, and he was very quick to be like, no, 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 yeah, let's, let's see that. Um, so I think that, like, <laughs> there, there is a process, and I did have the pieces casted. I didn't just come with, like, you know, um, a photo of it. So, and, of course, I understand your um, maybe worriedness about, maybe even doing that because that was inside my brain the whole time. I was like, oh, well, if I get this cast and my jeweler is going to get a funny idea and then so on and so forth. But th if you can, just the physical form will kind of be able to give insight and that should be enough. It was enough for Daryl. And Daryl yeah. my hero. <laughs> <laughs> Thanks, Jess. No, uh, I think we could, I mean, could talk later on this time, but it, there's ways to protect what you're doing, even, even plus it, there's ways to do things cheaper. I don't know where you're getting those costs from. Um, there's ways to use CAD to, to create things easier. I mean, there's ways to use maybe law school certification programs to help, depending on. There's all these different things you can do. Okay, I think, uh, first of all, it's time. So I'm going to say that. Second of all, I'm going to say that this was thought provoking perhaps angst-provoking. Um, so clearly, it's a topic that we were spot on to choose and that requires a great deal more digging. Um, very grateful to the three lawyers, as Steve refers to our attorneys as, but also very grateful to the two designers for coming and talking about the situation. We actually need to hear from, and Bliss, thank you also for calling out Marla's um, uh, case. Was it Bliss? Did I? No, that was me. Sorry, okay. Sarah. So anyway, because I think one of the things to do is to talk about cases 
um, so that we can learn more from how they were handled and what might have been successful approaches. Um, what we are going to do now is we are going to actually celebrate. We are going to go across the hall. We are going to lift a glass of whatever you choose. And then we are going to reconvene for the presentation of the two awards to Sata and to Pippa. And also um, prior to that, for a conversation with Pippa, who has just arrived from Japan, um, much to our delight, in order to um, receive her award. So um, let's break, let's drink, let's see eye candy and give awards and celebrate some more. Thank you, everybody. Uh, sure, yeah.